Hi there, everyone. <laughs> that was a sort of seamless fade out, right? <laughs> and hi there, Trish. Uh, we'll just kind of wait a few, uh, a minute more maybe as more people are kind of joining uh, the call because we had a great, a great sign up for this, Trish. And I don't know whether that's a terrible sign of the world or great in that people are resonating with burnout and also that uh, uh, we are all burnt out. So there's uh, there, there's something interesting for us maybe to, to explore uh, there. But uh, I just wanted to say hello and welcome uh, to everybody that's on, on the call. Uh, this has been recorded um, and Alex is actually here as well this afternoon. He's behind the scenes today as he um, is suffering from a bit of a cold. Uh, and flu. So, um, so he is around. He's here to help in the chat. And if uh, anybody has any comments or we have any technical hitches, Alex is there to is there to save us. But he's going to be off camera um, for the moment. Um, so, so just quickly, some kind of housekeeping um, bits and pieces. Uh, for those of you that are new to our masterclass and to Moment Company, uh, we are all. Uh, sorry, let me just admit somebody. Let me get that. Uh, so Moment Company, who are we? We are on a mission to help you reduce stress, anxiety, and burnout in the workplace. So we're talking about the right things today. And we do that by sharing just really simple, quick, and effective ways you can introduce mental fitness techniques into your work life. So we don't want to ask you to have to do anything more in your day. Our techniques are, are all about things that you can fit into things that you are already doing. And to that end, if you are new to Moments, if you give us a follow over on Instagram, uh, you can join Alex and I, usually Alex, twice weekly for some live moments, which are some live breath work and meditation sessions, and, and, and everybody is welcome to do that. Um, I guess maybe quite a good place to start today is just to kind of ask everyone, have you taken a breath today? <laughs> maybe we all just start by just taking a breath in breath out and just really kind of appreciating that we've taken this time this afternoon just to kind of do something for ourselves just get settled get comfy wherever you are you don't have to do anything today obviously we would love and welcome your comments and conversation. This is a completely safe space. Um, feel free to share and ask questions, whatever, whatever you want to, and maybe just say hi in the chat room and, and say where you're from as a, as a way to start. So as uh, those that know Alex and I know, burnout is something that is very dear to our hearts in the regard that we have personally experienced it very different ways it's manifested for us. Me, it was physical, Alex, it was mental. Um, but it's the whole reason, really, at the end of the day, Moment Company exists. We experienced it firsthand. We wanna share our recovery stories and what we did to overcome those. And that is why I am so thrilled to have fabulous Trish Bowles with us today. So Trish is a ICF certified professional ontological coach, which is a mouthful, Trish. <laughs> she also specializes in leadership and development and has a master's degree in spiritual psychology and over 15 years experience um, in digital marketing and ad tech technologies. Um, that really kind of dedicated herself laterally to that exec coaching and development side of the industry, um, which means that I know she suffered from burnout <laughs> too. And Trish has very kindly, you know, said that she would take us through her experience of burnout today, but also what she coaches companies like NBC, um, Universal and Amobi and other large US corporations and really kind of tackling that burnout um, question in the workplace. So Trish, without further ado, that's an, enough for me. Hi. Hi, that was an amazing welcome, welcome. there. Hi everyone, <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Fee and It's amazing. Um, so Trish, I'm going to start by asking you a question that, that we've asked our last couple of guests. And that is, how do you personally take a moment right now? How do you look after Trish? 
Yeah, well, one of the big things is, so I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we recently moved to Marin County, which is sort of known for sort of its hiking and outdoors, and I have an almost four-year-old at home, so it's kind of hard to take a moment inside the house sometimes, so (laughs) I go take a moment by going um, for a hike here, there's like an amazing hiking trail kind of outside our front door, and I'll take the moment while I'm on the walk, but there's also this amazing like little rock that has like a lookout kind of over the bay. And I'll just sit there and I'll kind of have that be my sort of reflection point and my chance to sort of take a moment, like you said, connect to me and reconnect to nature as well and change up Mm. your up your environment. No, love lovely. I was kind of I was in that space with you. Maybe I'll get to travel again soon. <laughs> You're always welcome. Anyone's uh, welcome thank to you. visit. Um, so Trish, let's let's jump into what is burnout, right? Let's start with, with, with the big question because I feel like it's something that gets banded around quite a lot. And, you know, there's a difference between just needing a good night's sleep and, and real kind of what we experience and we talk about as, as corporate or environmental um, kind of burnout. So... How would how would you and how do you define define burnout? Yeah, well, burnout originally sort of started. It's funny that you say that because I know a lot of people are like, oh, I'm so burnout. And they might mm-hmm. just mean that they're exhausted or they're just tired or over it. But burnout actually um, was coined in 1975 by Herbert Freudenberger, who was doing a study on doctors and nurses, because it, initially it was in sort of caregiving roles that burnout was recognized, right? If you're taking care of patients, you know, that's when you're giving so much out. And the key thing to note with burnout is it has three main um, elements to it. And you need to have sort of all three for it to be classed as burnout. So the first piece is emotional exhaustion. Um, So that's when you're just caring too much and that sort of can manifest into physical exhaustion, physical symptoms. The second piece um, that he phrased was depersonalization, which is where there's the depletion of sort of our natural gifts as humans. You know, there was a decrease of empathy, compassion, caring, kind of an increase in sort of cynicism and negativism. Um, And then the third facet he talked about is a decreased sense of accomplishment. Um, And that's really just like a sense of like your own personal self-worth, you know, that nothing you do makes a difference, a sense of futility. And so this was pretty much the most common definition of burnout for multiple years. And now, um, if you jump to the next slide, like even the World Health Organization has really recognized because it is so pronounced They've also come up with definitions which are based off Freudenberg's original definitions, which similarly have three components, you know, so it's the feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion. So again, that's that physical element. And I really want to talk, and it's not just physical exhaustion, it can be health issues. You know, you talked about your burnout being physical. Part of my burnout was physical too. I was having these crazy migraines, like chronic would come all the time when I was really stressed out. The second piece again, which is similar to the definition um, that Freudenberger first said was the increased mental distance from one's job or feelings of negativism and cynicism. So again, it's that detachment. Again, it's that level of not being able to connect to human emotion, you know, and a lot of the emotional downfall of that is things, you know, like suffering from depression, really just suffering from a lot of mental and emotional um, issues. And then the third thing, again, which is very similar to Freudenberg's thing, it's that sense of reduced professional efficacy, you know, that sense that you're not really doing well at your job, you're really struggling, um, you know, the sense of futility around, well, what's my worth and what's my place in the world? And the one thing I really want to highlight with the whose definition is that they actually call it a syndrome and they say that it's actually just around chronic workplace stress that hasn't been successfully managed Mm -hmm. but I really just want to call that out that Mm -hmm. even though the who has put it in the frame of a professional workplace you can suffer from burnout even if you're not in a professional setting you know for example being a parent and I know a lot of parents Mm -hmm. especially during the pandemic 
you know, there's a lot of burnout amongst parents, you know, there's a lot of burnout amongst caregivers. A lot of people have had to take on caregiving roles with their families. There's a lot of burnouts, you know, in a lot of organisations have talked about all the essential workers, you know, doctors, nurses, teachers. So I just want you to know that, you know, it can exist outside of the frames of the professional world. And the thing we'll also, I'll also highlight here as well is that quite often it's the factors outside of your day-to-day -day work that have an impact on it. You know, I don't want people to think there's a correlation that it's just your work that's causing the burnout because quite often it's, it's things like right now, you know, three quarters of us are burnt out because of the pandemic. You know, the ongoing stress of having to deal with a global pandemic and a lot of, there's a lot of things going on in the world right now. It's all of those factors that actually impact burnout too. Wow, I feel that there's a lot <laughs> to, un to unpick there. And I, and even just um, going back to the very beginning, which was, you know, the, the, the origins of that around it being in the care professions and that empathy and people that, you know, you know you're giving so much, but maybe not getting, getting it back and then I guess in a in a more modern workplace environment that's something that's often felt as well and and then from what I heard too is that there's a, a real progression of the different phases of burnout but also that where your perception can become reality mm -hmm. so if you that reduced professional efficacy where you seem to have those feelings of negativism and, and negativity and you think I'm doing a bad job and you show up with your shoulders down and your head down and in that kind of frame of mind then that starts to become the way that you show up and that starts mm -hmm. to become what people see and, and you become a reflection of that internal dialogue and that is the face that you put forward when you walk into your your workplace you, you you're taking that energy that low energy with you and it, it, I really got that sense of you, you you become your own reality somewhat in that in that cycle of, of things it's how you show up definitely and I think that's the point you know I really want to call out too like we've talked about burnout like I know to that point of I was like oh my god I'm doing a terrible job because I knew what my standard of work was but when I was in burnout, I'd be like, oh, I'm doing a, a terrible job. Is my boss going to fire me? And then I'd get my performance review and it would be great, you know? And it was there was just these disconnects where it's like, because it was coming from my inner world, like what you were saying. And I think a lot of the work for burnout recovery and sort of the focus of the work that I do with clients is that it is inside work. You know, there are the external factors of you know your workplace other external things but at the end of the day what you can control is who you are what you believe and what you're choosing your inner world to me so that's kind of the starting point you know that I look at is it's like well how are we looking at the world and how can we rectify that or you know just change it and enhance it and give ourselves more space so we can sort of shift our mindset around that. And how did you first recognize in yourself that you were burnt out? For me, it was because I physically couldn't get out of bed for six days because I had no immune system left and I had got every bug going and I physically couldn't do it. A friend basically locked yeah. me in her house because I still wanted to go to work. I felt I was letting people down by being physically unwell. So what, 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 how did you get to the kind of realization that that was the point that you were at as well? Yeah, well, there were several factors, but I similarly had the thing, like when I would have these migraines, I could not get out of bed. And that would always happen around a stressful situation. I remember there was a lot of things that I do quite recognize. I remember having a panic attack. I was meant to lead a leadership workshop and I'm like, I don't think I can, you know, do this. Like there were things I was, where I was having sort of those things. But I think the thing that got me most is that part to that second part of like increased mental distance. Like I remember it was like 2013. I'd just gotten a new job. I'd just gotten engaged. I was planning my wedding. And I remember everyone just being like, aren't you so excited? Oh my God, this is amazing. You're planning a wedding. And for me, that's where I was like, no, I'm not excited. I actually have no feelings inside. I feel nothing. And at that point it was like, there was an element of depression too. But that was the point, you know, which is a subset of burnout as well at sometimes, but it's like, 
that to me was the alarm bell of to have no feelings, like to not be able to feel excited, to not be able to tap into those parts of love and joy. That was my sort of awakening of there's something not quite right here. Yeah. And, and are there some, for, for, for anyone that's, that's kind of listening in today or, or in the catch up, is there, is there any kind of questions that, that you asked yourself at that time or, or that we can be asking ourselves to kind of understand whether we're, we just need a week's holiday in the sunshine or whether there's something that we need to address more specifically? Is there anything that, that, that you kind of would recommend? Yeah, well, I think for me, um, you know, I think at the time what I needed most was to just tune into what I really need, you know, and to sort of slow down. And and I actually got help, you know. There's one of those things that for me I realised living in my bubble was not supportive. So one of the questions I would ask myself at the time is it's like, what support can I get from others? You know, to me, that's that a great was... question to ask, though, because that's an admission of of the need for help, right? That's that's a big mm-hmm. step in itself. It really is. Mm-hmm. And what was and that? that? Was... Did you find that you had the support around you all along? Yeah, yeah. And part of it too is it's you know, like I said, I just gotten engaged, and just even sharing with my fiance, you know, what I was going through and how hard it was, and to tell him that everything that was going on in my inner world was big. So starting with him, then starting with, you know, do I need a therapist? Do I need a coach? Do I need, like, there are lots of different avenues I was reaching out to. I spoke to my general, my GP as well, just to rule out any health things. Cause I mentioned there was the migraine stuff, there was things, but that was the starting point question to me is it's like, I can't do this alone. Where can I get help? So it's interesting, Trish, when you say those things, because one place you didn't mention was your workplace, Mm -hmm. the source of your stress and burnout, right? And you are now going into those large corporations um, in the US and doing burnout sessions with leadership teams. What kind of shift in responsibility are you, are you seeing from those organizations? And, and is, there, is there anyone that you think is doing a good job out there in that now? Because there's, there's this kind of cause and effect, isn't there? Because the workplace creates, creates stress, but doesn't do enough to kind of help with the, um, the recovery. And sometimes those statistics that we see around stress and burnout are all after the horse is bolted. That's what I call those statistics. You've already worn your teams down. You've already created that environment. Great, you're now publicizing that two thirds of them are stressed out, but what are you doing in the proactive sense? What can be done to help people from getting those, those uh, into those situations in the first place? Yeah. What does this workplace have in that discussion? And I think the biggest thing that I've noticed with the clients that, you know, I've worked, especially at big companies and especially, I mean, everything's changed since the pandemic too. And it's, to me, I think the biggest thing that companies need to do is create psychological safety. So as you mentioned, I didn't go to my work. I didn't feel that it was psychologically safe to say, Mm. I'm struggling. I'm, you know, I really need support here, you know, on the emotional front. And so a lot of the work that I do with companies, it's like, how do you create psychological safety? How do you allow it so people can bring their whole selves to work? You know, a lot of people talk about, the bit getting extra holidays and flexibility and all of that stuff is great at providing, you know, the external support for things. But the biggest thing that companies do, and I see a trend towards, it's just that being, you know, creating a workplace of psychological safety and where you can, you know, bring whatever you're struggling with, you know, having regular one-on-one check-ins with your team where you talk about these things, um, And just have, you know, just a policy. But I think part of that comes from the top down too, where it's like the leaders are the ones that need to work with their own struggles with burnout. Because if they're not coping, they don't have the capacity, as we've seen, to support anybody else. Exactly. It's such a big thing in leadership. It's it's huge. If you don't have an empathetic leader, then then you're not going to have the capacity or or they don't have the capacity to support you. Um, when you, you, you're faced with those challenges. I, I know when I speak to people and, and say what we do, I quite often get leaders who will say, 
well I've never been burnt out so um I, I, I don't think and you know I don't understand the need for this in my organization because they're just seeing everything through their own lens and they have mm. no idea that people in other areas of their organization might might be feeling pressure as well and mm. um, I remember when we first talked you, you actually explained something to me which made a lot of sense in the workplace environment which was the the kind of stages mm. of burnout um, is that maybe Alex? Can you, my trustee, yeah. Alex? Is there a next slide that we talk about? Um, if we go on to the next one, maybe um, we know the, the stats there, and that's the, the kind of phases of burnout. Because something that really, really resonated with me and resonates in this workplace environment is that first honeymoon phase. You've got a new job, you're working with a new team, you want to be seen to be doing a good job, you will stay late because you want to prove that you've, you know, you've got, the, they were right to hire you. And that in itself can be a marker of, of burnout. I find that fascinating because we all do it. That high level of energy of anything new is that first phase that we, we need to be mindful of. Can you maybe talk us through some of these different these different levels and what to be yeah yeah definitely and I think that's the thing that most people find surprising which when I talk about this you know with my organizations or when I'm on clients it's like funny that it's like the burnout starts in this first phase that they call the honeymoon phase which is like when you're super excited like you've just got a new job or you've just started a new project or you've just had a baby or you know whatever it is like you're just like this is a you're in the honeymoon phase high. Of whatever yeah. that is yeah exactly it's like you're super optimistic you have like high energy levels like you said you're working late and there's a real level there like that's where it's like because your cup is full you've started it with a full cup and so you have like depths of you know creativity energy things like that and that's one of the flags you know I think that we bring it back to the workplace that managers need to be aware of too is it's like someone's starting a new job and they're starting at this point it's like how do you build in natural check-ins so that they're not burning out right because you really you're stoked you have you're like riding high on the energy of the new right and then gradually as you move through the stages so like the next phase is like the onset of stress so this is when you know basically it's like you can't it's like a marathon you know like you just people are sprinting at the start in the honeymoon phase but you cannot keep <laughs> going at that rate yeah. you have to slow down so now the onset of stress has come on your productivity and optimism are waning and then some you know stress situations are coming in and then it keeps sort of growing down to this chronic stress you know where you're getting stressed all the time you know there's lots of anger that's when that cynicism the detachment um, and the sort of physical the first two things really start creeping in you know from the the two the three elements of burnout and then, you know, by four and five, you're in the burnout zone. You know, that's when it's like real behavioral change. That's when, you know, you're starting to depend on, you know, substances to support you to get through work. I think that's something I should talk about too. Like with burnout, it's like mm -hmm. alcohol and food were my things, right? Like, you know, just keep like just trying to like get through and coffee and all of those things. And then you end up in habitual burnout. So I think habitual burnout's when it's chronic, you know, that's when you have depression, that's when you're really, really in it. And I think the thing to note with the five levels of burnout is like when you're at level five habitual burnout, it takes longer to move out of it, you know, like it took me a while to move out of my burnout because I was at number five for a really long time, you know, maybe a year or more. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the, the onus is on, especially managers and organizations is to really manage points one and two so that they never get down to three four five you know in terms of the workplace setting that said there might be areas outside of the workplace that might be contributing to the burnout but I think one of the things that leaders can do is just allow an employee to bring their whole self to share this to share what they need you know, so that it's easier to bounce back and sort of just stay in the realm of, you know, one and two. It's really interesting. I, I actually just did a, I did a webinar podcast yesterday with a, a local group here in the UK around addiction and recovery, because I openly share that I'm nearly three years sober now. And that was a huge, huge part of my recovery journey um, and, and why I do now. And when I look back on my burnout phase, I was 
six dirty vodka martinis in and over exercising and doing everything too extreme and then wondering why why I had burnout but what I found interesting when I was doing my research on that was that 27 percent of people say that work stress in the UK makes them drink more and then particularly over here the kind of booze culture the reward with alcohol the you know, partying after work and, and it's all fun and games until it's not anymore. And what workplaces are not very good at is setting those boundaries. So your mm -hmm. boss, I'm, I'm speaking from a UK culture, it might be different with other places, but you know, they take you to the bar and it's a free bar and everybody gets overexcited. But if someone gets too drunk, that's frowned upon. And it's like, where are those boundaries? Where are those lines? We become enablers of that behavior but actually there's there's this real intrinsic crossover between people drink more because of workplace stress and then often workplace environments can be enablers of of, of drink and alcohol and kind of that kind of behavioral culture it's a real kind of you know mismatch of of um support and so when i was asked yesterday you know what would you recommend to employers to get around that my sort of one, and I was allowed like a, you know, like almost a, a one sentence um, response. Mine was quite simply choice. Mm. Let's give people choice and options because if you create options for people to pick different things and to do things differently, then those options means that there's more space for individual choice. People, I hated having to say, I don't drink because then people ask you, why not? And no one wants to admit you have a problem with it. So if you just have options up front, you're not asking people those difficult questions, which in turn create more stress because you create more space for individual choice. So for what it's worth, that was my little tip to, because I lived a long time in the the three and four of this before I flipped on to five. Um, and there's a fine line between escapist partying and I'm not doing too well and I'm doing this to cover up. So yeah, options was my, my way forward. Yeah, 100%. And I relate to that too. I mean, I'm Australian. So <laughs> my whole start working culture and life culture was all about the way to let off steam and bond with coworkers mm -hmm. more than anything was happy mm -hmm. hour. So I remember being an enabler like that too and I think that's what needs to sort of shift to is it's like the corporate structure in the corporate world is has to move from this herd mentality that everybody has to be the same like when we talk about psychological safety again it's mm -hmm. like you said create choice give people the options to do what's more in line with them and to not be reprimanded <clears throat> so excuse me for their choices yeah. so I think that's the part of it too, is, is leaders um, having the wisdom, you know, to allow that to be and celebrating difference. So much of the old corporate structure is it's like one size fits all. You all have to be these cookie cutter employees. And that's not how it is. We're all individual people, you know, which means we need to celebrate as individuals and we need to actually allow ourselves to be seen as individuals too. No, abs absolutely. That choice is so important. But as you say, it's hard for corporations because they've got, you know, people are filling roles. They're not necessarily people that they're often seen as people in culture teams are sometimes the people that think about the people last or oh, the irony, the irony of it. But are, are there some examples of, of some good organizations you've seen over in the US or, or, or some examples of some good corporate behavior that you've seen recently? Yeah, well, I think, you know, and just one thing I'll say for our answer question too, is it's like, you'll see that it's changing, right? Like now companies need to have, you know, a reckoning because it's the, heard the great resignation, right? Like now, one of the things that the benefit, you know, with the pandemic, one of the benefits is people sort of reassessing what's their life meaning. Do they just want to be a number to corporations, you know? And so I think that, you know, more companies are definitely trying their best. Like I said, one of my clients um, in BC, like they're really trying, you know, they really, it's hard, you know, they're trying to create this space. They're trying to create psychological safety. They're trying to create awareness. And for a company that's as large as that and part of a conglomerate, like I think that they definitely, you know, are trying to lead the way there. 
Um, and in terms of like some of the other companies that I think there is still, you know, one of my favorite companies still is like, you know, Patagonia and, you know, where it's like they built their culture very differently from the get go, you know, they wanted to be different, they wanted to value employees and longevity. And so I think that, you know, a lot of people are definitely, you know, starting to do that and be more in tune with that, like some of the tech companies here in the Bay Area, again, are really pivoting around that a lot so I think that it is slowly happening um but that's the thing is as us as the employees it's like we have to give voice to that of, of what we need and to share that and get clear on you know what will support us as an individual and us as a collective to sort of recover from mm -hmm. From the collective and individual hard. burnout. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and so I guess that's a good segue um, into that kind of individual, because obviously everyone um, has shown up today for their own personal personal um, reasons and, and, and interest and perspective on burnout. So perhaps we could just kind of use the time that we have to kind of allow for that sort of personal reflection because we all do experience things in in a different way and I know that you wanted to use this session to kind of get a little bit of a positive outcome at the end but also to allow people just to kind of drop into their own personal burnout story and also just to see where have a bit of a check-in yeah definitely yeah and so I'd love to just sort of you know, lead us through just a bit of an exercise, you know, and before we get started, I just want to just, you know, just like you said, reiterate is that the road back to burnout is individual. And yes, we talked a lot about the corporate responsibility and that goes hand in hand, but I think the starting point for any of it is really tuning into yourself and getting clear on, because as we mentioned, your burnout symptoms were different to mine. Um, Alex had different ones. And so the solutions that maybe worked for you may not necessarily work for me. So I really want to get clear on, you know, the road back is about going inward. Um, and, and you know that that difference just to touch on that briefly is a, is a real challenge for leaders as well because it manifests itself in all different experiences for everybody so it's not like hey if your employee is doing this and this equals uh, burnout that, that we you know that it is a challenge but I guess it's about creating as you say the safe space first and foremost and then it's about us as individuals finding that voice within us to recognize that we need to ask for help and, and recognize however that might be showing up for us at that time so so yeah sorry I interrupted you over yeah. over to yeah, you that's perfect well yeah so I'd love to um invite you all to sort of just take a moment right now you know you can feel free to close your eyes if it's more comfortable or if you want to leave your eyes open you know and sort of just have a really soft kind of gaze right now but I really just want to encourage everyone to just slow down take a deep breath in and breathe out take a breath in and breathe out take another deep breath in let this be one of your deepest breaths of the day and breathe out and as you're really just focusing on your breath you're breathing in and breathing out your intentional breath work just thank yourself for showing up here today thank yourself for being willing to come here and learn about burnout to ask yourself what you really need And in the energy of slowing down and self-gratitude and compassion, I just want you to think about right now, where are you in your burnout journey? Take a moment to reflect on any symptoms you're having, any stages you're feeling. What's your unique burnout journey?
And once you've been able to connect and get a little closer to what your burnout journey is, I just want you to reflect on this next question. Right now, what do I need to better support myself? Right now, what do I need to better support myself? And feel free to take as many breaths as you want, stay in this place, you know, really connect with your burnout journey and what you need right now. But if you do feel ready to sort of come out of this moment and share, you're welcome to. But I'd like to encourage you, if you need more time, stay in this moment. Thanks, Trish. I actually just want to stay here. <laughs> I do too. What was coming forward for me? What do I need? I was like, I need to be in this moment a lot longer. <laughs> it's 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 so simple, isn't it? Just just taking that space where you're not distracted or you don't have any judgment for what comes up. You're just asking yourself that question and you're not hanging a solution to the end of it. You're not hanging an outcome or even action to the end of it. You're just asking yourself a really, a really simple, a simple question that feels like a really powerful place to start. Yeah. And I'd love if any of you, you know, are willing to sort of share what came forward to you, like feel free to put it in the chat if you want to sort of share what, where you're at in your burnout journey or what you feel that you need, like you're, you know, as V said at the start of the call, it's a safe space. And part of this work is just having the ability to just tune into yourself at any given moment and to ask yourself. I, I can you see need. the lovely Lucy. Um, hi, Lucy. Uh, I've just been thinking of you all week, Lucy. So it's funny that you're here. Hello. Um, is laughter. You know, sometimes we just need to let go a little bit. We need to we need a blooming good giggle and we just need to like shake it all off sometimes it doesn't always have to be a serious answer that comes up sometimes it can feel flippant sometimes it can feel like a really kind of yeah simple solution and my, my big thing is music as you many people might see me share daft things on LinkedIn all the time but the power of music and the power of just getting out of your head and just kind of being in a different a different zone and something I find with music as well is that um the, the the lyrics that we listen to can be really powerful so when you're in that lower energy place try and avoid the love ballads and the power angst because you're repeating those negative words to yourself all the time as opposed to going for happy more positive tunes it's just like it sounds so obvious right but if you have an earworm that's really negative and a song that's going around in your head switch to something more positive and it can have an immediate immediate reaction it's really quite powerful definitely no and that's one that's worked for me we have um well it's, it's different with the toddler but like she wasn't feeling well and I was like let's have an impromptu dance party you know and it's those <laughs> things too right it's like put on something she really loves <clears throat> dancing queen by ABBA but so we put those you know and we just like you gotta do what you've got to do <laughs> mm -hmm. shift the energy and so I'm just really conscious conscious of time this time always goes so so quickly um mm -hmm. And, you know, we asked if you had just had some um, some tips that you could just share with people to kind of take away on some of those more sort of positive outcomes and things to look out for. And um, Alex, I don't know if you can um, move our screen, but oh, gosh, well, Lucy, of course, rescuing an eight month old puppy. Yeah, that's going to make life a lot easier as long as it's not weighing on the floor too much. But yeah, oh, gosh, I'm obsessed <laughs> with getting a dog all all year I'm fighting fighting the urge but yeah animals that unconditional love oh yeah that's something that that can definitely bring you happiness 
Yeah, and bringing you in the moment too. Like, you That's know, dogs are just yeah. so joyful in the moment, whatever they're bringing. They don't so. judge. They don't judge. Yeah. They might give you a side eye if you don't if they're not gonna if you're not gonna take them for a walk, but they, they don't really judge. <laughs> oh dear. Perfect. Yeah, I know it's great. Um yeah, but so just finishing up on some tips, I just have this little quote from the Dalai Lama, you know, if you feel burnout setting in, if you feel demoralized and exhausted, it's best for the sake of everyone to withdraw and restore yourself. So I really think that's the point for really hitting the point home, you know, it's like, really, it's like, you have the power to support yourself. And it really comes from the inside out, you know, like really getting clear on what's best for you, you know, before you can start having conversations with your organization or your boss, you really have to get clear on what do you need and what's going to support you. Yeah. So, you know, in terms of sort of the five tips, it's like starting knowing that you have the power to support yourself, you know, in, in, when I say in the power to, power to support yourself, it's from a place of compassion and love and, I love how you're talking about, about no judgment with the puppy because that's actually perfect too. Like this is really about no judgment. Don't don't let there be any judgment about where you're at with burnout. Like I know for me, probably the reason I was in it for so long is because there was a lot of judgment riding on it. Like, why don't I feel great? You know, why am I not doing a good job at my work? Like there was just a lot of judgment riding along the actual symptoms that made it really hard to move out of it so I think it's really important to know that you have the power to let go of that judgment you have the power to love yourself be compassionate with yourself and give yourself space to figure out what you really need yeah I agree and yeah and then, and then you know we always talk about small things add up to big change mm -hmm. so you don't have to go on a, you know, 30 day silent retreat to sort your mind out. There, there's little things that you can be doing every day, whether it's playing with a puppy, going for a walk to your rock and a hike, whether it's just doing that little simple exercise. Yep. Daily choices matter. Thanks, Lucy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's just those little things. And, and as it, it, I know the message is there from us all the time, but it, it can be simple it just you just got to show up for yourself every day and it can be when you're brushing your teeth it can be when you're boiling the kettle it can be before you go to bed at night but those simple things like can make can make a huge difference yeah. um and and as you started off by saying as well that support from others don't be scared to to ask for friends family or professional support Definitely. if that's yeah what you need mm -hmm. great Thanks, Trish. Um, I'm just really conscious of time. And if I wrap this up in a minute, I will give myself a medal. Um, but <laughs> what I just wanted to share um, with everybody is that um, in moments we have um, been working hard behind the scenes and we've created something that we call the Moment Academy. And we have pulled together uh, different coaching um, courses and Alex is there if anybody's looking for mental fitness and one-to-one -one coaching solutions. But we've also brought together um, programs with partners like Your Good Self, Trish. Um, and Trish is actually going to be running a four-week burnout program um, with us starting next month that will be available through our academy. Trish, do you want to give us just a quick overview of what's in that four-week program? Yeah, definitely. You know, so basically, as I sort of talked about, you know, burnout, it's really about going inwards. So the four week program is going to start with you sort of working on getting clear on what your current burnout status is, you know, then it's really about building a plan from a place of compassion, focus on well being, you know, building a foundation of well being. And it's really going to touch on, you know, additional things around mindset work as piece on mindset, your emotional, how you're looking at things, as we talked about with that cynicism piece, mm -hmm. our sense of efficacy pieces that tie into burnout, like mindset and shifting a lot of those negative beliefs is really important. And then it's really just about building a roadmap of connection for you, reconnecting to who you are, your values, what's important to you, and using that as the basis to sort of rebuild up from burnout and, and it's from a very personal status. perspective as well right it's something yeah that it's really... interactive 
Exactly. And most of it, you know, there'll be some theory behind it, but a lot of it kind of like this brief exercise of asking yourself something. There's a lot of reflection exercises. So nothing's prescriptive. It's all about you reflecting on what works best for you. Great. Well, we're very excited to have you as part of our Moment Academy uh, launch, Trish. Um, and we're really looking forward to, to sharing that with everybody in the coming weeks. Um, I just want to close out by saying thank you to everyone. We're only a minute over, yay. Uh, thank you to everybody that, that joined us today, whether it's live or it's on, on our YouTube channel. Um, really appreciate interaction and everybody calling in from around the world. And Trish, thank you so much for joining us and being part of our moment movement. And um, we really appreciate your insight and, and the exercise I felt that I huh, took a chance to take a breath myself this afternoon. Great. Well, thank you so much for, yeah, all the work that you guys are doing at Moment. It's incredible and so needed. So, yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Great. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks so much. And thanks to Alex as well for keeping us online behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye now.